Good morning. Welcome to the first meeting of the ARB of March 2018. Um, could we have the roll call, please? Good morning, uh, Chair Firth. Are you present? Here. <laughs> <laughs> Vice Chair Balte. Present. Uh, Board Member Thompson, I believe, might be a few minutes late. Uh, Board Member Liu. Present. And Board Member Guyer. Here. Thank you. Thank you. Just looking for my carefully prepared notes, which I think I left at home, which may speed the meeting up. Um, all right. Our first, now let me find my agenda packet. Oh, here's, good, we've got a full compliment. So if the record could show that we now have board member Thompson present. Present. Great. There you go. Okay, are there any oral communications about matters not on today's agenda? Seeing none, um, go on to the next item, which is agenda changes, additions, or deletions. Does staff have anything to say on this respect, in this respect? I have received a request to consider reversing the order of Pasteur Drive and Sherman Avenue, but I think Pasteur will be a quick item. So I would propose we go ahead with that. All right, item number one, or item number two on our agenda, is 500 Pasteur Drive. It's review of a change in the entry plaza at the new Stanford Hospital. It's listed as a consent item. We don't actually have a consent calendar, but the previous approval of this project called for it to come back on consent. Uh, the item involves changes to the entry plaza, plaza, including replacement of a central fountain with a 28-foot tall sculpture, a full set of plans. And a written report had been submitted to us, made available to the public. If no one in the audience or on the board wishes to discuss this item, we'll just waive hearing and proceed. Is there any member of the public who wishes to address this item? Is there any member of the board who wishes to discuss it? In that case, uh, a motion to waive further hearing and recommend approval of this item subject to the findings and conditions in the staff report would be in order. I will make a motion that we uh, recommend approval of this project. I'll second that motion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, it's approved. Okay, our next item on which I do have speaker cards is 350 Sherman Avenue, uh, the construction of a new four-story parking structure with rooftop photovoltaic panel structures and two below-grade parking levels on top of an existing parking lot in the California Avenue Business District to provide 636 parking spaces. Final approval of this project by the city requires a zoning code amendment as it's larger than the law currently allows. The Planning and Transportation Commission has recommended this change uh, and our review is proceeding on the assumption that the City Council will agree. Uh, the CEQA public comment period has closed. A final EIR is being prepared, showing all adverse environmental effects can be mitigated to acceptable levels. Um, the CEQA public comment period has closed and a final EIR is being prepared. Did I just say that? Um, when the board reviewed this project in January, we asked that it return to us with a possible second entrance in the future and more work on the wall behind the staircase opposite the future public safety building. So, staff report. So good morning, we have uh, Matt Rashke here with our public works department um, to give a presentation. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm Matt Roschke, I'm Public Works. I'm the senior engineer and the overall pro project manager for the city for this project. Um, and uh, uh, Amy French, the, our, our chief plan, um, planning official, had uh, written the staff report, and um, I think it was pretty straightforward. Uh, so I'd, we'll go right into uh, the architect's presentation. And so I'd like to introduce Mallory Kusenberry of Rosters and Rostralis Kusenberry Architecture to present his design changes. Thank you. You have Good 10 morning. minutes. Thank you. 
Um, as you uh, mentioned, Chair Firth, uh, we, we had presented to you previously, and uh, there was great discussion, and we really appreciate the discussion, and we've taken a lot of the comments and a lot of the discussion we, that we had and moved on and took it as a design challenge, and we feel like uh, we've incorporated a lot of those comments, and we feel it's a better building as a result. So um, briefly, again, this is a, what you saw last time. This is a picture of uh, the structure looking up Burke Street, as you know, with four stories above grade, and um, and four below, and two below, and the uh, presence of the uh, photovoltaic cells. It's a large building. It takes some particular um, m uh, moves to make it uh, weave into the neighborhood, and uh, uh, those include the uh, scrim of uh, terracotta scrim that's around here that we discussed last time with you, and this uh, large uh, public stair that, uh, that cascades down on the Bird Street side and um, inflects toward Cal Avenue. Now, <laughs> Um, my specific presentation today will focus on the continuance items, so it'll be a narrow focus on those pieces, and, and we understand them to be as, as listed there. First of all, the Birch Street Wall, the design development of that focusing on durability, maintenance, and visual interest, uh, to address the lighting along Jacaranda, to revise the plans to show potential future ingress, egress to Jacaranda, well, future inject, ingress, egress. We then led that to Jacaranda, and I'll explain that shortly. Uh, prepare a landscape plan and prepare a tree mitigation matrix and plan. And there's one new item, an item that has mo been modified since the last time we presented to you, and that is the Ash Sherman Corner based on new information we have about the transformers. And we're gonna present that so you are aware of what's going on for that. But let's start with the Birch Street Wall. The discussion as we understood on the Birch Street Wall was that we had talked about it as a, an opportunity to host the shadow play from the scrim out the side. The ARB had, uh, the board had mentioned that, well, okay, so that's good for the few times that the shadows are there, what about the rest of the day? And there was also some expression of concern about the plaster wall, is it durable enough, and maintenance and things like that. So we addressed those. Um, we took, the first couple of steps that we took were to, first of all, get more information. I think Board Member Thompson, you had asked about, is there a way to kind of show exactly how much is happening? So what we did is a series of animations to determine data on how much sun actually hits those walls. You're looking at summer, which is the greatest amount of time that the uh, light hits the wall. It, goes, it actually hits the wall until 11 a.m. Uh, in spring, it's until around 9.15 a.m. And then in the winter, it doesn't hit the wall at all. So the second step that we took was to say, all right, Good point. If we're only, if it's all about the shadow play and it's only happening during these times, it's more limited. So, w our second step was to expand the consideration of this space and think of it as a 24-hour optical experience that had three key elements. One of those elements was the shadow play that happens in the morning. The second element was the glow, the changing glow of the canopy overhead, and the third element is a kind of opportunity for specularity and reflection and. Um, and, and the visual interest that that might create during off hours when the sun is not hitting it. So right now you're looking at the winter time when the sun doesn't hit the wall at all. And you can see at the roof of the canopy that there's a changing glow as it reflect, refracts the light down into the space, changes throughout the day, um, but there is actually no shadow play. So this idea of actually expanding it to an optical experience that has three layers was crucial. And then so we're gonna look at spring now. And so it leaves the wall around 9.15 a.m. So our proposal right now then is to take that wall, that plaster wall we were discussed, that we discussed, and install a large format mosaic of porcelain tiles. Now those are not the colors that you see, and that's a diagram. The colors of the tiles are represented, the three tiles are down here below you on the floor here, and we also have a sample that we can pass around if you'd like to see it, it's right there. They are above colored, light colored, same color tile, but the tiles differ in their surface texture. There is a gloss tile, there is a hone tile, and there is a texture tile. The percentages are shown in the diagram up there. So you can see we, we use those colors just to highlight the pattern. And the idea is that on a vertical, on the horizontal lines, it's very rational, but the vertical uh, differentiation is more random. So it creates uh, more of a unpredictable mosaic uh, pattern that you can see right there. And if you look closely, this is actually an animation. You have to look closely at this. The idea is that the different tiles behave differently depending on how the sun hits them. I'll, uh, I'll show that again. Whoops, I'm sorry, going the wrong direction. I'll show that again. So if you look, the tile on the left is a reflective tile, the one in the middle is the honed, the one on the right is the uh, textured. So what happens is when the sun hits the honed tile, the, the polished tile, it doesn't reflect. But when the sun doesn't hit it, it reflects what's behind you, what's lit. The, sh the textured tile, in turn, 
only has depth when the sun hits it, and when it doesn't, it flattens out. So the idea is that these are all the same color, but there'll be a very subtle interplay of the three elements. And I'm gonna go to the next slide. So on the left, that's what the wall looks like from the top of the stairs when the sun is hitting it. On the right, that's what happens when that wall is in shade. It's kind of a, a fireworks of specularity that are picking up reflections, and as a bird flies by, a cloud goes by, whatever, you'll see portions of it fragmented, reflected onto the wall. And if you look closely on the slide, left-hand side of the slide on the right, you can see that the scrim is reflected as well. So as you move, it's a level of intimate detail that we hope suggests that as you, it, it invites you to be close, because from a distance, it's gonna look like one color. But as you come closer to it, its richness starts to uh, show itself, and uh, the idea is that, in a way, it almost looks like, from this animation you can see when it goes back around to the morning time, it almost feels like the wall is an after image, as though it was photographic paper that was printed uh, in a moment by the, by the scrim, and it has some visual interest uh, afterwards, and then this is what it looks like at night. So it really is a 24-hour 24 24-hour 24 visual experience. Oh, and not to mention, porcelain tile is denser than ceramic tile, highly dense, strong, Graffiti proof, zero maintenance. So it will, fingers, I mean, it's, it, you, you know, you, it, it actually, it, porcelain is so dense, it actually is not porous enough to accept spray, uh, like, or, or an ink, so. All right, second topic, lighting on jacaranda. This is the lighting scheme that you saw before. In brief, again, the idea was to have a grazing light on the scrim all the way around to soften the glow that comes customarily from inside a parking structure, create a more, um, a softer edge around the garage. The question was about how we're lighting jacaranda. So this is a diagram of the lighting scheme as it moves to the jacaranda side. We're looking from birch and jacaranda. The idea on the scrim is to light it the same way all the way around for the re-entrant corner to actually light down to the base of the stairs so it's an inviting space to be. And then the red dots represent the lighting that's proposed for jacaranda. That is a wall-mounted luminaire. There's the luminaire right there. That would be in a regular pattern along Jacaranda that then, and this is a rendering of the actual lighting conditions in the end. So you can see it creates a low level, one story lit environment right along Jacaranda. So you don't have building mounted lighting that spills over at great distances. It allows the scrim to be grazed above with light and creates um, something that looks somewhat like an arcade as you look down the length. And we've included the lighting drawings in your set as well, which is represented here. The third topic is the uh, second means of egress. The discussion was, well, in the future, what if you want more than one way out of this garage? Um, it was agreed that we would not build it now, but we wanted to make sure that we didn't preclude the opportunity that if it determined in usage that it was needed to have a second means of ingress, egress, uh, one should be provided. This is the current plan. Uh, after talking to traffic engineers and our, um, and our parking consultants, everyone agreed that the best approach was to have it on Jacaranda. That was the most feasible. So if you look at the upper left-hand corner, this is the existing plan modified where a column is removed in the upper left-hand corner um, next to the elevators so that in the future, watch closely, there it is, you have the ability to actually modify it with this kind of an ingress, egress onto Jacaranda. Again, it's not being built. The idea is right now we're maximizing the amount of parking, but the opportunity is there so it's not precluded for the future. Uh, we have included the landscape plan as requested. There's a great deal of detail on there. I'm not going to go into it now. The short version is it's consistent with what we've been saying, that each side, each street gets an independent landscape identity depending on how much light or shade it is or whether it has the role of a stormwater treatment. Um, you can see the trees and the plants are located by, um, by their position within the project. And then below you see the site furnishings, which is based, uh, it's an extension of the site furnishings that was recently installed on Cal Ave. So the, receptacles, and we have added things onto the seats, so you can see the armrests, the seats are now, now more refined, more detailed, uh, dissuade people from sleeping on them, and they assist people in getting up and down from them. And then finally, in summary, the tree mitigation plan. The data is all there. 50% you see on the left of the existing trees, on the right of the proposed trees, 50% of the uh, replacement of the uh, canopy will be on-site, 50% will be off-site, the numbers are there, uh, but the idea is that the off-site mitigation are to be determined. We don't have the sites yet, but it will be within a half a mile walking radius of the site. Oh, oh, sorry, briefly, 
um, transformer. Um, since we spoke to you last, the corner of Ash and Sherman, you see on the left, the idea is we wanted to have that be a little sitting area. Um, however, uh, further study, we determined that it was necessary to build the transformers for all of the future potential electric vehicles. So all of a sudden, transformer in, uh, requirements went up. They can't be de uh, deferred. So to build it now, um, that transformer can no lo longer be underground. So the only reasonable location that we had a place for it was this corner. So the thought was to then put it in that corner, change the nature of that corner so you could see signage on the left, which shows uh, a, an opportunity for screening the transformer location, um, but at the, at the loss of the seating that we had shown previously. So thank you. Thank you. I have two cards from the public. Jack Morton to be followed by Hamilton Hitchings. Good morning, members of the ARB. Jack Morton, representing the CalAB business. Um, so we're very excited that the provision for the second ex exit has been added. Actually, we'd like to see it operational from the beginning, but we'd like some way of proving that it can become a useful uh, addition to the, so then we, th we think we're gonna need that almost immediately. Um, one of the things we, asked maybe you might consider making a construction requirement is that there be attractive webbing around the site since it's going to be a construction site for a couple of years that webbing can be used over um, to cover the you know the standard construction uh, wire fencing uh, and it can be used again for the uh, police building um, it's important to us that jacaranda lane both at the parking structure and at the police building be a community thoroughfare. There was some uh, suggestion from the police department that they might want to close off one end of Jacaranda the, at the park end. We're, we would like that to be a thoroughfare. Um, the lighting and everything, we've sort of moving in the direction that it's a nice walkway for, for people to, to get to Cal Avenue and the restaurants there. Um, it's uh, moving along, maybe it's taken more time, but the result is something that the, the business community and the neighbors seem are very excited about. So we, we will have major problems. So the other thing that to be a construction requirement is how we handle the loss of 300 parking uh, things and the staff has looked at or wants to look at possibilities of valet parking or whatever but but that really needs to be built into the to the final steps um, on jacaranda lane if you've walked had a chance to walk down there right now there are probably i think i counted 10 uh, garbage and recycle bins uh, we wanted to enclose somewhere along that side a enclosed so that the lane is a lane not not just a uh, home for recycle bin, bins um, i'm going to close by saying we're very appreciative of staff and your time that you've taken to listen to us as the business community. Um, California Avenue is a, is a vibrant area. We want to keep it that way. And we're looking forward to starting the project in October as staff intends. So thank you again for everyone for their patience and in particular for taking community input. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Morton. Sure, and this is Hamilton Hitchings. Yeah, give it more. Mr. Hitching has asked for an extra minute or so, which if there's no objection, I would grant. Thank you very Go much.
Chair, my name is Hamilton Hitchings. I was on the Citizens Advisory Committee for the comp plan. I worked on the land use and safety elements. I'm gonna be talking to you about uh, my input that I gave on the DEIR for the public safety and garage, and just talking about seismic probabilities. I'm very involved with the City of Palo Alto's emergency services, and uh, building codes are, of course, the best way to help us minimize damage. The USGS has come out with a new uh, prediction of earthquakes. You all have a copy of this in your panel. And you notice at the top it says there's 72% chance of a 6.7 or greater. This uh, report was published in August or last updated in August of 2016. So the DIR on page 160 uh, needs to be updated to reflect that. In addition, the DIR does not mention what's on the top of your page two, which is the table that shows the probability of stronger earthquakes in the Bay Area over the next 30 years. According to the USGS, this is a USGS report, uh, there's a 51% chance of a 7.0 or bigger, that's bigger than the Loma Prieta, but there's a 20% chance of a 7.5, which is a very strong earthquake in the Bay Area in the next 30 years. And in addition, another measure besides magnitude that they use to measure earthquakes is the amount of shaking at the site. It's called modified mercurial intensity or just intensity. And the DIR on page 160 says it's a seven according to ABAG, but that's not what the ABAG website says. The ABAG website, and this is a screenshot of the ABAG website, says it's an eight. And specifically on this page, they say that uh, by an eight, they mean at least a 10% probability in the next 50 years. And that's a standard to which the buildings should be built. It's important to get the requirements right in the DIR. So when they do the structural uh, design, it meets the right requirements. Now, one of the things they talk about is the fact that the city, or one of the things the city did was do a geotechnical uh, investigation of this site, and they cite a number of numbers which are from the USGS, which differ from the numbers on the front page of this USGS report. The ones in the geotechnical report by the Ramag engineers are significantly lower than the ones on this USGS report that was published after the Ramag report. Uh, so for example, they say the probability of a fault of an earthquake on the Hayward Fault at 6.7 or greater in the next 30 years, according to Romig, is 14%. According to USGS, it's 33%. For San Andreas, the Romig engineers say 7%. USGS says it's 22%. In addition, the Romig report does not cite these stronger earthquakes, like a 7.0, 51% probability, or a 7.5 which is a 20% probability. So in summary, um, I'd like to update the DIR to use the latest USGS and ABAG numbers to make sure we have a good mitigation section in it, to explicitly state the garage will be designed to avoid serious injuries if it experiences an intensity eight earthquake and I know the uh, public safety building is coming up next time, but I explicitly state the public safety building will be designed to remain operational after an intensity eight earthquake unless cost prohibitive. Thank you very much for listening and for your time. I volunteer for public safety and that's my passion, so thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd wish to speak on this item? And so questions of staff, the applicant? Yes, I have a question. So would the applicant like to comment on those issues? A little confusing who the applicant adheres, but. Uh, the, uh, the, the actual structural design uh, of, of both buildings will be actually based on the Romig report, so we'll, we'll be taking that information back to Romig and, and, uh, and requesting that they reevaluate if there, if there was any uh, update needed to, to the geotechnical report. Um, additionally, we'll be uh, 
due to the gr uh, groundwater dewatering uh, uh, that's become a, a hot issue lately, we're going to be doing some additional geotechnical investigation just rela related to that aspect to find out uh, how we might best uh, minimize any groundwater pumping needed for both, both buildings. So you're telling me that you're telling us that you're going to ask Gromick to consider the material presented and see if there are any changes needed in their report? Correct. We, we've, we've previously uh, yeah. had some... I, uh, I know you've had previous correspondence. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Any Can questions? I have one follow-up. Yes. And then also just the public safety building um, has to be a... Uh, what is it, the standard? Is it life safety? What do they call it? Uh, the es building code. Essential services. Essential services. Sure. But my understanding is that the garage does not. So there, there are two different standards within the building code for, uh, for, these, for, the, for this project. Uh, correct. Um, but uh, as Hamilton mentioned, uh, I, I think the, uh, the aspect of the shaking and, and any potential um, just detachments of all, of all the uh, terracotta baguettes and everything like that needs to, to take into account the, uh, the, the, the correct seismic hazard that, that does exist. So the garage will be designed to avoid injury and the public safety building to keep working. Thank correct. you. Okay. Now, do we have other questions? Yes, I do. Commissioner Balte, yes. Board Member Balte. Thank you. For the architect, please. Uh, this is a detailed question, but it saves me pressing on it later. The tile treatment on the staircase wall, where it uh, meets the corner, uh, I'm looking at drawing ARB 1.04 in the upper right-hand corner, where, it, where there's the recess in along Jacaranda and Birch. How is the tile uh, treated at the edge there? The tile has a thickness, and do you see that thickness, or is it somehow recessed or trimmed out? Um, I'll answer provisionally because that would be a design development detail, but our idea of what tip, traditionally when we do tiles of this sort is to edge it, potentially stainless steel or some kind of a, a treatment at the edge so that you engage the thickness into the material behind it. So I okay. don't have an answer right away because we haven't actually detailed that. Thank edge. you. Second question, could you address please why the transformer can't be underground in the basement? Matt, would you like to take that on? Uh, yes, the the size of the transformer needed for the future electric vehicle requirement in the uh, the new uh, the adopted green building tier two code requires that uh, we have uh, electrical infrastructure for for potentially twenty five percent of the stalls being EV and and that uh, the electric utility requires that size transformer up front so that, and. Because it's a, a approximately a 1,500 kV kVA transformer, they would not allow that to be underground, which we had originally planned to put it in an underground vault along in J Jacaranda. So we had to find a new location. Uh, I guess I mean, why couldn't it be in the basement, say, in the corner of the parking garage, uh, where you have a 20-foot square spot? Uh, no, the electric utilities standards wouldn't allow that. They they have they have to be. Uh, in fact, only in the downtown areas, would they even allow a transformer in a vault if it's an, small enough? But uh, their, their requirements are above ground and, uh, can, and such that they can replace it quickly, lift it off the truck, and, and, uh, and, and re replace the transformer if needed. And did you explore the option of having two transformers separately in vaults? Yeah, we, we've, we've, uh, we had many meetings with the electric utility, and it was actually quite frustrating, but to, to try to come up with a... So what was the rationale that two could not be allowed? Uh, that's also part of their policy, which, and, and they assert that, that those are all council-adopted policies. Thank you. I'm guessing it's to make their life easier <laughs> to replace it if they have to. I have a follow-up question. Will the transformer be very visible from Ash Street? Like I see there's a screen on. Yes, uh, it will, uh, the, um, there is no currently proposed screen on Ash. Uh, in part, there's a limited space because of the access requirements all the way around the transformer. We do have precedent, I'm sorry, I'm looking for the slide to point at it as we speak. Uh, the Visa building on the next block has this transformer on Ash as well right in front, right at the base of the building, exposed. So it's not unprecedented, it's not optimal, but it's not unprecedented on ash to have the transformers in those locations. I don't have a picture of the visa, but you can see it. And here's the image that I was looking for. Um, so yes, it is visible from the ash street, 
but our take on this was to treat it as a piece of infrastructure that looks like it's incorporated. The wall height that has a sign it would be the same height as the transformer. Seems like it belongs there, as opposed to taking fencing measures and trying to screen it with stuff that just looks worse than if you hadn't screened it. That was the approach that we took. So. And I have a follow-up question. So with the elimination of those benches there, where's the nearest seating? The nearest seating is about 75 feet to the east, or maybe a little, it's mid-block on Sherman. Thank you. Anybody else? I have a question for staff. So we have a, a, a um, in one of the uh, emails from a resident across the street in the um, condominium project, she had requested like one parking space be removed on their side of the street. It's like in between their project and the visa building. And I was wondering if um, staff had responded uh, to that question. Do you know, I can point. Could at, you tell me what day that email came in? Yeah, it's, it was in the packet. Let me, let me pull it up here. This is um, Ann Steinle's email. So packet page. And it's um, yeah. Sorry, yeah. packet page 109 is my response to Ann Steinle. Um, okay. But that was from January 12th. So um, I'm looking for, uh, what did you say the packet page number? No, I think that's right. Is the, um, One, t I guess it's 110, one ten. One nine. One oh nine. One ten. Yeah, one oh nine is uh, the one I'm saying. I did respond. Um, yeah, I think that you were saying you would forward it to. Yeah, to staff, to to Matt. Did maybe. I not forward it to you? Well, yeah, we'll, we'll have to talk to transportation about that. Yeah, Being I mean, it's not the an ARB. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, purview item. I think it was site, basically it was like sight lines, but it seems to me that that's more on their side of the street than, than the parking garage side of the street. Your okay. argument is that it would make turning safer, right? On page 110. Yeah, I think, um, I think Matt replied elsewhere in another email that basically they're trying to locate all of the, it makes sense to locate all of the garage entrances together so that they can all see each other, see who's coming in and out all at the same time. And she also asked for a second entry exit, which this plan does accommodate. Anybody else, any further questions? Discussion, Robert? I have one last, oh, sorry. I have one last, last question. So I think Mr. Morton had asked for like a centralized trash enclosure. And then I also saw that in the staff comments, I think for public works, there was also a mention of a, some sort of centralized trash um, enclosure. Uh, and so I was wondering what the, uh, what the staff's thinking is with regard to that. Well, we have looked at, uh, you know, some of, the, some of the problem in Jacaranda is simply the, the non-use of some existing um, enclosures that are out there. Um, so we're, we've notified uh, the, the zero waste group to, to take a look at uh, some potential increased enforcement on that to try to get people to use their existing enclosures. And then uh, we're, we're also gonna be um, working with the Hotel California to, to come up with a better solution for, uh, for their trash enclosure or the lack of a trash enclosure for that, for that particular site. So uh, there may be some opportunity to uh, uh, create a, a temporary enclosure near w where we have the, uh, the future exit uh, worked out with, because we've eliminated that column, we may be able to uh, squeeze a, a, a small uh, uh, enclosure to, to shield, shield uh, their, their bins from, that, from view for there. It's, uh, it's something we'll be looking into. Okay. And then also, as those, if and when those projects, uh, when those, if and when those parcels redevelop, the trash would be inside their own buildings. So, okay, thank you. 
I guess I have a follow-up question too. So what is the thought about the screening of the site, about the perimeter of the site during the construction period? Uh, typically, we would have a, a construction fence, and uh, the uh, uh, it usually in, includes a, uh, a woven green fabric uh, for uh, for you know to keep it uh, a little less obtrusive to the to the neighborhood. So. But you're not considering art or something more aesthetically. Uh, having a, mm. a memory of the long-lived temporary enclosure of the utility site on Alma, much missed. That was a piece of public art that was a screening fence, yeah, for much the, smaller site. Uh, for, well, for this project, uh, we would anticipate construction to be within 16 months. Um, uh, so I don't know if, if... So the answer is no, we're not considering it at this point. If, Thank it you. It wasn't a direct consideration, but now that we've heard the, the idea, we'll, we. We could also consider it. Yeah, the yarn bombers may get you otherwise, yes. All right, um, I guess ready to discuss. Robert. Okay, uh, actually, uh, my biggest problem with the, 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 the project, uh, as I indicated last time, was just the fact that I think uh, the the way it's designed, it makes the structure look bigger than it needs to be, so I'm not really a fan of that. But going to the just the points that we talked about here, uh, I like the, the idea of the tile on the wall, but I think it's just way too subtle. I mean, you know, maybe as architects or whatever, we could appreciate that, but I think the average person driving by is going to see a white wall. And it's just, I, I don't see, uh, it seems like you're spending a whole lot of money and a whole lot of labor putting up a very large wall that has just such slight variations to it, and depending on when the light hits it and all this sort of thing, that I don't think anybody's going to stand there for 20 minutes and watch the sun uh, hit the various pores. So I, I don't really see that it, uh, it is going to do anything. Uh, I like the, the second entrance, uh, the ability for that. Uh, and other than that, like I said, I'm, I'm still on the wall as to whether to vote up or down for this based on just my initial concept of, I think the screening, as I said last time, just enhances the size of the building that it doesn't need to be. Thank you, Alex. Great, so I can support the project today. Um, thank you for the revisions. I think, they, um, I think, they're, I think they're well considered. Uh, on the, uh, to follow up on Robert's point about the tile, uh, I've been amazed at, like on, build, on projects that I've worked on, when we paint the same color on like cement board versus stucco, like they look like completely different colors. Just, it's just the shading difference. I mean, it's, it's really huge. It's really, I think it's actually striking. I think it, it was probably be, maybe it's gonna be more subtle if it's, if it's a, like a light colored, like an off white or white color. But um, no, I think there's something, I think there's something, I think there's something to it. Uh, I do worry about the grout. I hope you can provide a good gr uh, grout spec um, for that, because I think that's the weak, that's always like the weak point, especially for an, um, um, for porcelain tile, because it's so thin. Uh, I do like, I think I like the changes that you made to the lighting in the alley, I think that's good. Uh, I generally like all of the landscaping, uh, uh, the plant selection, I think, was done well. And what else do I have? Yeah, so I think that's all that I have on this one. And uh, to go back for a moment on the um, second entry exit point, I, I did want to sort of clarify the concern that I had with one entrance is that the way it's designed here, there's no stacking if there were a gate control, right? If there was like a, if you had to stop and actually take a ticket. Mm -hmm. From the very, from that very entrance, you have to make a decision to turn left or go straight and go down. And generally we try not to do that in like a parking garage design. Um, and that you have cars exiting and, en exiting and entering at the same point. And that's also sort of like a no-no on high, what do you call it, uh, garages that have like high, high turnover. This one doesn't seem to, 
right? If I look at the numbers in the, in the packet. Um, but I actually have a hunch that there's like a, a lot of turnover right at lunchtime for people coming in and out, going, going to the restaurants. So I think that's why, that's why I wanted to have the second uh, entrance point. Um, so that's all that I have. I can support the project. Peter? Um, thank you. I also can support the project and uh, agree with what Alex has just said. Um, just to clarify, I think the idea of the tiles is going to work out quite well for the pedestrians. I think Robert's correct, driving by it will look like a white wall, but this is a staircase with people walking by. I think the tile will be interesting. It'll be fun, it'll be different, it'll be something you might actually stop and look at. The tile will give you a chance to maintain it better too from handprints and things like that. I do encourage you to think hard about the grout as well, the, the detail at the edge. While I don't think that's an issue for us to press further, I'd encourage you to consider recessing it somehow into the concrete so you don't rely on a metal strip. That's obviously a tricky construction detail. Um, I would like to come to the transformer question. I think that that's unfortunate, uh, extremely unfortunate, to take a, a busy pedestrian corner in an area that we're trying to enhance pedestrian activity, uh, look, at the, look at the way we're treating the police building, and to put a large transformer there based on what I, what I understand to be policies from the utility department. It's not even some actual thing is 15 feet tall or we need to get a crane in front of it, it's just the policy. And I, I, don't, I can't accept that. On a corner like this, to put a big transformer there based on those reasons is not enough. So I, I can only support the project if we condition it on finding someplace else for the transformer. Um, there's just too many opportunities to have a bench or landscaping there, which is just too important and becoming even more important. That's what I have to say. Thank you. Hosma. Hi. Um, since we're talking about the transformer, um, I, I feel similarly in that um, it is just too bad, and, and I, I hate it when, when a project gets to that, when it's just too bad. Um, and it, it would be great to find some different solution, um, whether it's, I don't know, a, di a different solution. I don't want to be too prescriptive. Um, because as, as it stands, that render that, that's on, oh gosh. Uh, yeah, ARB 1.02, where you can see this green box. It's sort of very strange, um, unless the green box is done very beautifully. I, I'm not sure. It's it's there's there's just a lot to think about there. Um, so that's kind of a, a, a sticking point. Um, the the wall solution that you've come up with, the tile wall solution, is really exciting, and I think it's going to look really wonderful. Um, I think it'll enhance the pedestrian experience tremendously, um, so I commend you on taking that extra step because I think the project will benefit greatly with it. Um, and, and yeah, so I think uh, all, all things said, otherwise I'm pretty happy with how, how things have come along, so uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, I must say I'm happy with how things have come along too. I think it's a much better project and grateful to the neighborhood and uh, the commercial community, the business community, and the designers for thinking this through. Um, on the issue of the transformer, I've had a lot of encounters with utilities and their standards, um, and the most notorious being the modification of the Stanford sculpture at the corner of El Camino and Page Mill, carefully designed sculpture with three large vertical poles in front of it, obliterating it. Um, and I understand from staff that the argument is that these are city adopted standards and can only be modified by the city council. Not the argument, but the statement. That, that was the, the argument they gave us. Yes. So this is probably a comment that we need to address to the city council. You're looking at me when I think. I'm, I'm looking at you all. <laughs> Just can't do both sides at once. <laughs> Okay, um, those who haven't spoken on the, um, I'm just trying to get you to get to a motion that's gonna pass um, one way or the other. Those of you who haven't spoken on the transformer, do you have any comments? I agree, I mean, I've had arguments with the utilities and in most cases, 
I think we just have to press harder. Most people, most of the time, uh, the municipalities or the architect or whatever just say, well, okay, if that's what's required. But I think there could be other ways if that means either uh, that instead of being at uh, street level, it be dropped down because the reality of it is I figure they have to prove why they have the objection. And I still think it's just because it's convenience of them uh, maintaining it because airflow wouldn't be an issue because you could put it down uh, under, you know, as uh, Peter was saying, on the, uh, the uh, basement level and have plenty of air going in. So it's a matter of the ability is, uh, and the thing is that transformer is so big, if they ever had to replace it, it would be a crane situation anyway. So if they drop the thing down so it's at the basement level but have the top of it open so you can't see it from the, from the street level, then you could bring a crane, drop it down, pick it up, and they could service it from the basement. So there are numerous ways it could be handled, and I think we just have to be more forceful in uh, indicating this is what we want. Alex? You know, I would say this, this I think this is, has come up before on other projects, and it is because of the, um, or parking requirements for the electrical electric vehicles, mm -hmm. and I think I think on this case it's magnified because the garage is so big, right? Um, but it's come up on other projects on, at a smaller level. So, um, so maybe the board should make some sort of consideration, make some sort of uh, deliberation about it, and forward it to the council. I'm not prepared to do it on this particular project. Not like I don't know enough to make to make a recommendation on it. But uh, generally, we do require transformers to be screened. Um, where is the switching equipment and whatnot for the rooftop solar facility? Uh, the, uh, the idea for the rooftop solar is, is actually we're going to look into feeding that over to the public safety building. So that, that will go down to a, um, uh, an underground conduit that, and go across to, to the public safety building. So we're, we're looking at uh, actually having this as part of the, um, the, the lead in order to uh, achieve uh, potentially a, a, a near net zero energy building on the, on the public safety building. We're, we're going to utilize this solar to, to feed that. And, and I always forget the names of the various pieces of equipment that are required to convert this direct current, alternating current, and feed it into whatever. Where is that? Is that going to then be offsite? Well, that, that would be on the public safety building side. Yeah. I see. Thank you. No, I, I just I have was a question, gonna, if um, that's the case, sorry. because it is a public safety building, is that all of a sudden going to become an issue, seeing as though it needs to be up after a, uh, an occurrence? Is that going to change the uh, structural requirements of the parking garage because it's holding the solar panels? No, because this is more of a secondary. Um, okay, uh, so it's the idea being that uh, all the power is there. This is just over and above. Okay, correct. All right. Would somebody? Is there any further discussion before somebody makes a motion? Would somebody like to make a motion? Yes, I'd like to move that we approve the building as submitted, with the condition that the transformer be, re be relocated so it is not visible on the corner. Is there a second? Hearing, would somebody else like to make a motion? I move that we approve the project um, and provide some provision that the transformer either be moved or screened from public view. I will second. Okay, so restating that slightly, you would move approval of the project with the provision uh, with the modification to conditions that the transformer on the corner either be underground or relocated or screened so that it's not visible from the corner. Is that right? Yeah. Any discussion? Uh, yes, a question. When, when you say screen, does that mean they could put a metal enclosure around it? It wouldn't be visible in that case. Is that what your intent is? No. I think we want something aesthetically complementary. So then it would need to come back to the board or for a uh, subcommittee. Are you sure you want to do that on this project where we're trying to get this moved through the city? 
Staff want to give us some guidance? Yes, thank you. So uh, and this project's gonna go to the city council and I think we've heard and can communicate the board's comments to the council and, and in the meantime, staff can also get together with the utilities department and understand what the options are. And so perhaps a condition that says that the city council shall consider an alternate location or locations for the utility transformer uh, could be incorporated into the motion and we, we can see if we can work that out um, as we get to the council. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to propose a friendly amendment along the effects of what Jonathan Leitch just said that we recommend to city council to consider an alternate location for the transformer and remove the word screened from your original motion. Does the seconder accept that? Yes. I, I can accept that. All right. Um, and, and we need to know if uh, and Alex made the motion. Is that right? Who made who made the motion? I've lost track. This one made it. Alex, uh, seconded. Alex seconded. Right. Does the seconder accept that? I'm not sure I understand what ha just happened. You're saying consider for the city council to consider relocating the transformer and you're taking out? So I, I can restate what I said, uh, that the city council shall consider an alternate location or locations of the utility transformer. So this gets at your issue of the one transformer versus two transformer issue. But I also asked to remove the word screening the transformer. I think that's just so vague as to be a huge loophole. Well, if I can comment here, I think we have we are in support of the project with ex the exception of the transformer location. With respect to the transformer location, uh, there's some disagreement about whether if it can't be relocated, it should be screened and how it should be screened. Um, and I can't hear the consensus on that point at the moment. See, but I think if you leave that opening, the PGD is gonna go for the screening because it's a whole lot easier. Well, it's CPAU, but yep. <laughs> Well, I think what we're asked, I mean, I think staff's suggestion is that we ask council, council to relocate, let's ask him to relocate it. Why not yeah, get rid of consider? So ask council to relocate. Because the council's gonna do yes, they're, what they're, they're gonna do whatever they're gonna do, but right. this is our recommendation to them. Right, you're All we ever do is recommend. Consider. So we ask the council okay. to, re to relocate it. It's their project. Okay, I can accept the amendment. So it's now a motion to approve, recommend approval of the project with the additional, with the modification that includes our recommendation that council relocate the transformer if possible to preserve the open area at the corner for seating and other amenities as in the original plan. Is that acceptable? That's correct. Alex, okay. And of course, council will do what it does and it may discover this whole thing is infeasible. Uh, of course, we want to have efficient and <coughs> efficient and convenient maintenance of our utilities, but sometimes if you're gonna bring in a crane, you have time to unscrew a few benches. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed, none? You're here. Oh, sorry, no. beg your pardon. <laughs> supposed by Robert. That's okay. uh, no, <laughs> it's the far left. Um, so, Chair, we typically give the dissenter an opportunity to speak as to his or her dissent. All right, that's a good idea. Any comments? I think this dissenter's preference typically is to say he's already explained his reasons. Thank you. No, exactly. I've already explained why uh, I wasn't in favor of it. So, it, uh... okay. Uh, compliments to staff and those involved and uh, thank you I'm sure that the uh, business community looks forward to a speedy uh, completion of the project okay our next item is 1451 Middlefield Road this is item number four this is another city project I'll give everybody a few minutes to reorganize themselves Two minute break.
what uh, software do you guys render those renderings in? Is that out of Revit? Or? Short and succinct, and see what you say. Yeah, it's it. I'm ready. All right, I'll call the board back to order. Uh, this is item number four, which is, the address is 1451 Middlefield Road, and the request is for a modification of a previous ARB approval of a new junior museum, recommendation for approval of a new junior museum and zoo building. Uh, the project was approved by the council with a standing seam metal roof that this board also approved in December. Uh, and the staff proposal is now that it be replaced with composition shingles. The Historic Resources Board considered the proposal last month uh, and recommended approval 5-1. There are no minutes available, is that right, of that meeting? That's correct, it was um, very recent. And it's, but there is a tape available. Um, I was, nice rain. I was not present for the last hearing, though I was for the earlier ones, but I did review the minutes and plan to participate. Um, staff have yes. a presentation. Thank you. Yes, the HRB reviewed this uh, last, was it last week? The 22nd, I guess that was 
last week. I get confused with February, it's a short month. Um, and they uh, wholeheartedly, I guess with one exception, recommended the, the change. Um, you know, part of the HRB's purview is to look at um, you know, a building on a historic site, uh, the entirety of the site uh, is you know, called out or that piece of it, Lucy Stern, the Girl Scout House, which also has comp shingle roofing, and um, they felt that it was a, it was a much preferred um, roofing material to the standing seam that had been pre uh, previously recommended by the a ARB. So um, that's their recommendation, and um, the applicant is here with a presentation to describe um, clearly why they're making this change. Thank you. Thank you. If we could hear from the applicant, you have 10 minutes. Hello, board members. Thank you for having us again this morning. I'll keep this relatively brief. Um, just a quick recap. The ex Could you introduce yourself for the record? Oh, I'm so sorry. My name is Sarah Vaccaro from CAW Architects. We're the architect for the project. Um, this is the existing site plan. Uh, just to refresh everyone's memory, we're um, adjacent to the historic Lucy Stern Community Center, as well as the Lou Henry Hoover um, Girl Scout Building, which is eligible for historic review. Um, the Rinconada Park, Walter Hayes Elementary School, and the residential neighborhood across the street. In our proposed site plan, we're seeking to drastically clarify site circulation for vehicles, pedestrians, and bicycles. We're reorganizing the new JMZ building to have a more civic presence on the site, strongly reflecting the forms and organization of the Lucy Stern Community Center. This was one of our original renderings that we brought to the HRB last summer. There was concerns about the color selection of the metal roof and walls in this rendering, so we went through um, a study of a number of different color options for the roofing material last summer with uh, the ARB's input as well. This was one of the intermediate steps and ultimately landed on a taupe standing metal seam roof color with white cement plaster walls and wood accents along the, the facades. This was approved by the ARB or recommended for approval back in September and then ultimately approved by the council in December of last year. We're here today to propose a roofing material change. <clears throat> While I understand it is not in the ARB's review purview to consider cost implications, this roofing material change from going from standing metal seam to composite shingle will save about half a million dollars for the upfront construction costs of the project. This will allow us to save important visitor experiences for the project. Um, again, we're proposing to remove the taupe colored standing metal seam and replace it with composite shingle roofing in a sage green color. Um, while this is, a, the lifespan it can be up to 20 to 50 years, we are seeking at least a 20 year warranty for the material and workmanship with a prorated 21 to 50 year warranty for the comp shingle material. These are just reference images showing the aesthetic of a standing metal seam versus what we're proposing today, the comp shingle on the right. These are updated renderings, elevations along middle field showing the composite roofing along with the same um, white cement plaster and wood accents along the facade. From the, the parking lot entry approach, you can see that the roofing is actually not very visible from this side of the, of the complex. Just to review the, the, the context, the historical context, the Lucy Stern Community Center has clay tile roofing um, along with cement plaster walls. The Lou Henry Hoover Girl Scout building has composite shingle roofing in a brown color with uh, vertical wood siding. The existing JMZ building, which will be demolished when our new building is built, but just for context, has um, wood shingle roofing. And most of the residential neighbors across the street along Middlefield have composite shingle roofing. There's, I think, one or two that have clay tile roofing. Um, for, for consideration in this discussion, while it's not part of the current project we're seeking approval on, there is a goal in the next zero to five years to add photovoltaic panels on uh, almost half of the roofing surfaces. Um, you can see that in this diagram. And so in that, in the next five to 10, or sorry, zero to five years, we're hoping to add photovoltaic panels on top of the composite shingle roofing. 
in those areas. And then the longer term future consideration approach, you know, in 10, 20, 30 years when the composite shingle roofing start, starts to age, um, the friends in the city are hopeful to look into um, further advanced roof, uh, photo, photovoltaic roofing technology solutions for the complex. So in that case, the entire roof would be replaced with photovoltaic cells similar to the Tesla roofing um, shown here. And that's all we have today. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Um, are there any members of the public who wish to speak to this item? I have no speaker cards. Okay. So questions? Yes, I have a question for staff, uh, Amy French. Um, we don't have the minutes from the Historic Resources Board meeting, meeting, but I thought I heard you say that they did not only approve it, but they actually suggested that it was preferable to have the comp shingles. Is that correct? Yes, that was my understanding is they, you know, they weren't all that pleased with standing same in the first place. Um, and I think they were, um, you know, clear about the, the surrounding um, context uh, being, you know, featuring shingles, uh, both in the residential and at the Girl Scout house, which is eligible. Um, that's the closest building to this building. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Discussion, Ozma. At this time, um, I, I don't see any problem with the change in the roof. Um, I, I, of course, wasn't a part of previous conversations um, on, on this project, but as, as I see it right now, um, I don't see a problem with changing it, so I can approve this. Peter. Um, I can accept the change the way it is, thank you. Alex. Yeah, I can accept the change. Robert. I guess I'm the bad guy again. I, uh, I like the standing seam metal roof. I think it works well with the design of the building and putting the comp roof on it uh, just so it looks like a residence across the street isn't really the, uh, you know, this is not a just a big residence that you're trying to blend in with the, the neighborhood. Uh, it is, uh, uh, you know, something unique. And as far as the, uh, uh, the Girl Scout house, I'm guessing probably at one point that had clay tiles of some sort on the roof probably, and in a cost situation somewhere in the past, they probably placed uh, comp shingles on it. But, uh, okay, you're shaking it, maybe that's not the case. I just don't see that building uh, having started life as a uh, comp roof. But anyway, uh, no, I think it ought to stay the way it is, but it looks like I'm being outvoted anyway. Yeah, Peter. Um, I, I've been very conflicted about this, and I, I think what Robert just said uh, swings me away from thinking that the comp shingles are okay. I, I've always felt that the standing seam roof was the right thing. I really want to be a team player, and when the Historic Resources Board thinks this is a better solution on a historic site, that changes what I think. But um, I think this was reviewed as a building with a special kind of roof on it, and as a civic building, that was a big part of why we all agreed to do it this way. Um, so I'm going to support what Robert is saying, that it should, be, it should remain a standing seam roof. Thank you. I realize I had a question I didn't ask. Um, lots of standing seam metal roofs are designed so that you can easily add solar panels. Was that the kind of standing seam roof we were going to have? Yes, the standing, standing metal seam roofs can accept photovoltaic panels. Right. Thank you. I didn't get to watch the entire HRB discussion, um, and I'm sorry that minutes were not available. Um, but I've thought a lot about what they've said. I agree with Robert that a public civic building is not just a large house. Um, it's a different kind of thing. We hope that it's going to last longer. Uh, we hope that the materials meet a higher standard and that the design does too. And it's less about a personal individual expression of preferences. Um, I think that the metal roof was an important design element. Uh, I think it's quite visible from a lot of places within the project. I think this change would have a significant and not good effect. Um, 
I'm very glad that Lou Henry Hoover House has come out of the shadows, so to speak, and is now seen as perhaps worthy of National Register listing, whereas before it was an afterthought. Um, I will tell Robert that the Girl Scouts are always broke, and so it probably was. Whatever it was, the inexpensive roofing material at the time were not the Boy Scouts. Um, but my understanding of the standards is that buildings in historic districts is buildings should look like they're built when they're built. Um, and that's certainly true of what happens in that area now. And designing a building now, you would design it as you did with that metal roof, with that it's, it looks like it's built now, it's adapted uh, to photovoltaic technology now, not 20 years from now. Uh, so I believe it should stay as it is. I do not believe it meets the standards with the alternative. I understand that the city may, because it's constrained, elect to proceed in this way in any event, but what they ask us for is our guidance and recommendation based on our findings, and I could not vote to approve it. So somebody needs to make a motion and explain uh, why, if they're recommending denial, which of the findings they can't make. Alternatively, make a motion to approve it. Um, oh, sorry, I'm just gonna just offer some more thoughts on this. Um, the, of course, I haven't seen a, I, I don't think I've seen a render of this with the standing seam metal roof, um, but just looking at the renders that are here right now, the architecture in itself does not indicate anything residential. Um, and so despite that, you know, there's a suggestion to use uh, a roofing material that the other residences are using, the architecture as it stands right now already defies an old style of construction and design. Um, and so I actually don't, I don't know that changing the roof material will actually compromise the aesthetic of the architecture as it stands right now, given, given what I'm looking at right now. Um, and in that sense, I still think that the roof can change to this composite shingle. Okay, can I move that we deny this, recommend denial of this application based on the in inability to make finding number three. I do not think the design is of a high aesthetic quality. I think with this change it becomes an average aesthetic quality, not a high aesthetic quality. Therefore, I think we should not approve it. Is there a second? I'll second that. A motion by Commission Board Member Balte, second by Board Member Gruyer. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Nay. Nay. Thank you. So you have our recommendation and our commentary. Thanks. Look forward to seeing this building in any form. Uh, next item is 3045 Park Boulevard. Okay, we're going to take another two minute break for setup. Long enough for me to get a cup of coffee. I'll be right back. There you go. Oh, no, we're not. I don't have any money. Nice, <laughs> Put me on the spot, huh?
Jonathan's just like it. Better without this. No, just Yeah, I think we're fine. Thank you. All right, let's see. It is almost 10 o'clock. Um, we have two more agenda items. Uh, they may proceed fairly rapidly, but if they don't, we'll take a break for lunch at some point. Um, all right, we are on item number five, which is a public hearing concerning the land at 3045 Park Boulevard. It's a recommendation uh, from the staff for approval of a major architectural review to allow demolition of an existing office building and construction of a new two-story, approximately 29,000 square foot research and development building. An initial study and mitigated negative declaration were circulated uh, for public comment. They're still being circulated hmm? till March 26th. So if anybody has comments on that aspect, you can still do so. The zoning district is general general manufacturing with an automobile dealer combining, it says here, combing district. Um, may we have the staff report? Uh, thank you, Chair Berth. Yep, my name is Graham Owen. I'm a staff planner with the planning department. So I've been working with the applicant on the project that's here before you today. This is 3045 Park Boulevard, as you mentioned, and this is a project for a 29,000 square foot R&D building uh, located at the intersection of Olive Avenue and Park Boulevard, as you mentioned. Um, the cur currently, the, the application was reviewed by the uh, ARB on two uh, previous occasions, uh, once on July 20th of last year, and then again on November 2nd of last year. Uh, so this is the third hearing for this, for this project. Uh, this application is subject to the interim annual office limit ordinance, which is still in effect um, and has a uh, approval window uh, for, for qualifying projects, of which this is one, uh, between April and June. So a decision, um, should it be made on the application, would need to take place during that time frame. As you mentioned, uh, a draft initial study of uh, mitigated neg negative declaration were circulated uh, last week, and that circulation period will run for 30 days. Uh, there were uh, four potentially significant environmental impacts that were identified uh, during the initial study uh, for hazardous materials uh, related to the soil that's, uh, that's on the site, uh, as well as nesting uh, birds uh, and archaeological and tribal cultural remains uh, that may be present on the site and would be unearthed during construction. Uh, with the mitigation measures that are contained in the staff report and the MMRP, uh, those, all of those impacts would be uh, mitigated to a less than significant level. So the, the application has undergone um, some significant site design changes since the application was before you uh, in November. And I can go through those uh, briefly, but I know that the applicant will also uh, have a presentation as well to detail these. Um, most significantly, uh, the project had involved a, a standalone uh, above grade parking structure on the left side of the site, uh, close to the 195 Page Mill Road building. Uh, that structure has been eliminated um, and in, in return, the, the applicant has returned with a underground parking garage that's beneath the building. Uh, Circulation-wise, uh, the access to the site, vehicular access to the site has been flipped uh, from the left side of the site to the right side of the site so that it's uh, to the right of the Olive Avenue intersection. Um, Placement-wise, the building has shifted to the center 
of the site uh, so that it's aligned with the Olive Avenue T. Um, and then in addition to that, they've also um, taken the area that was uh, previously proposed to have the parking structure and are now proposing to do a uh, plaza and a, uh, basically a patio area for the, for the tenants of the building. Um, the, I, I don't want to spend too much time on these slides because you have updated, updated renderings that were provided uh, today, uh, but there have been some changes to the, to the architecture of the building. Um, namely to the mullion patterns as well as the, the solid sections as well. Um, there's also a, a wood soffit um, overhang that's, uh, that's quite, a, quite a change from what was previously proposed, which was a, uh, a white metal um, overhang. So those are uh, fairly significant design changes. Um, so with that, uh, staff does recommend approval of the application uh, with the findings that are contained in the staff report uh, and with adherence to the draft conditions of approval and MMRP. Um, so I believe that the, the applicant has a presentation as well and would like to present that if the board wishes. Can we hear from the applicant? I am. Good morning. My name is Jeanette D'Elia. I'm the COO of J. Paul Company, the applicant. Um, we're very excited to bring you the updated plan for 3045 Park. We've worked very hard with staff to uh, achieve what we think all of the goals of the city are with respect to this, this building and this redevelopment, and we think it's going to be an exciting project for the city. With that, I'd like to introduce Tom Gilman of DES Architects, who will walk you through the the new design. Thank, Thank you. Would you mind spelling your name for our transcriber? Sure. It's uh, J-A-N-E-T-T-E, -T -T -E, and the last name is D apostrophe capital E-L-I-A. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Tom Gilman, T-O-M. <laughs> She's had practice, he or she has had practice with your name. <laughs> um, uh, so Tom Gilman with DES Architects in Redwood City. Um, so back, uh, so we've been here a couple of times, and uh, um, I want to thank uh, the, both uh, the Architecture Review Board as well as the staff. Uh, we've worked um, a good deal of, and had a number of meetings over the past four months, um, and have come back with uh, what I think is really a very, um, a much better project. Um, this is one of those situations where going through these processes have really yielded some great results, we feel. Um, you know, uh, we're at the end of, uh, of the, the intersection at uh, Olive and Park, uh, the context adjacent to the mixed use uh, project, the 195 page mill. Um, just a blow up of some of the, you can see the existing building upper left, um, upper right is the building adjacent to us, and then uh, middle left is the uh, mixed use building adjacent to us. Um, as staff had indicated, um, we really went back to the drawing board, took a completely new look at the site um, after the last conversations, and again had a number of uh, had a number of uh, meetings with staff, uh, working uh, working with both uh, planning, uh, transportation, and as well as the urban forestry group. Um, and s as we've centered the site, we heard loud and clear, let's try to do something that we can provide a real strong accent at the axis of, of Olive and. Um, and uh, park, and so have, have recentered uh, recentered the building. Um, one of the major issues that transportation had was they really wanted us to reduce to one driveway, and so we went through a whole series of schemes about how to do that, how to avoid. As you may recall, at one point I think we had about three or four dead ends, uh, you know, in various places on the site. Um, we worked with them um, in terms of creating a site plan now that has no dead ends, as well as then moving that parking structure under the building so it has easy direct access from the garage right up into the building itself. It's two bays wide, it's two double loaded bays wide, so we have circular um, movement, uh, auto movement uh, within that. So again, no, no dead ends as well. Um, as you can see on the plan on the upper right, we have um, a turnaround. Uh, for automobiles and then the ramp that would head down into the, uh, uh, into the garage itself. One of the happy results that came out about this was we gained this uh, major landscape park, uh, this kind of buffer between ourselves and the uh, mixed use. And it was one of those things that at some point the light went on, it's like, man, I can't believe it. Um, how, could, how could this happen? Um, I think we're over 7,000 square feet of, of a landscaped garden 
area that can, you know, can be a great amenity for the, for the employees in the building, but also it's, it's about a 65 foot wide um, buffer between ourselves and the mixed use building. Um, in addition, uh, we have landscape berms that separate that from the street itself, uh, right along the street, and we'll have also some seating, some public seating that would occur. Um, we've inflected the building, notched it back just a little on the, uh, the right side as you face the project uh, to uh, assist with the movement of, of uh, folks parking on site uh, toward the lobby ele element itself. Uh, the lobby is centered um, on the uh, axis then from, from Olive, and then we have a secondary lobby that would occur at the back so folks that are uh, parking at the rear of the building in that parking lot uh, could easily access uh, that point as well. Um, here's a, a little blow up of, the, uh, of that uh, amenities area. So a variety of landscape uh, kinds of features, um, all um, these are, this is full depth, there's no parking under this, so this is full depth planting. Um, so we would expect uh, to get really sizable um, over, the, over the years, um, as well as uh, permeable paving uh, for the pedestrian, uh, the, the, the plaza kind of spaces. Um, this is just a, um, a landscape plan kind of showing the variety of trees. Uh, in working with urban forestry, um, originally Dave Doctor, as you know, he's, he's now left, but we've been working with Elizabeth as well. Um, the thought was it'd be nice to have maybe a little bit of variety along uh, for the street trees on park, and so we're actually using Brisbane box uh, as opposed to London Plain everywhere. Um, along the south side against the Groupon property, they have liquid amber on their side. Uh, we're providing uh, Chinese pistache, so there's some variety. Um, along the Caltrain side, Valley Oaks, and then along the, the northern side against the uh, mixed use building, a combination of, of um, uh, some oaks as well as podocarpus or some fern pine uh, kind of trees. So a variety of trees. And the one, and you know, again, landscape approach here is, is drought tolerant, uh, uh, native planting with uh, all, ir you know, uh, drip irrigation. And we'll be uh, setting this up so that uh, we can convert over to uh, reclaimed water should that at whatever point that, that becomes available. Um, we have some small amounts of accent trees um, uh, that, um, that occur along the front of the building as well as in that garden area, and those are uh, Muscogee uh, crepe myrtle, um, which are a little bit more, uh, less drought tolerant than the others, but urban forestry felt that on balance uh, we were probably okay there. Um, Looking at the building, um, again, we heard a number of comments and uh, from, from both yourselves and then working with staff as well. Um, we've introduced a, more hor a stronger horizontal uh, kind of element uh, between floors so that we uh, essentially are able to downscale the building so it has um, a more pedestrian kind of scale from the, the street itself. And uh, we're still using a metal panel. Um, a white metal panel, which I think there's a board there that, uh, that you've probably seen. Um, and with the idea of having a very clean and pristine kind of look to the building, we've had great success in using that type of material. It's a, a pre-finished Kynar uh, kind of surfacing. It looks great after you know, many years. Um, but in this case, we've also introduced a um, large scale panels, but we've introduced a running bond kind of patterning, something that's just a little more um, a more relaxed kind of look, if you will, something that's a little bit friendlier, more pedestrian than simply a very rigid, straight, you know, blocked kind of uh, uh, patterning in terms of the jointing. Um, one of the comments that we had heard from you before was um, the complexity that the glazing seemed to have. And so we've tried to simplify that so that we've really reduced the number of, of mullions and the number of, of divisions. Um, much larger glass panels, we're talking 10 by seven and a half feet panels of glass, um, high energy, um, low E, um, efficient glazing. Um, the main uh, lobby area itself, um, oh, well, here's the view with the crepe myrtles. <laughs> um, the, the main lobby itself, uh, structural glazing, um, it's a really small amount of, of uh, glass as we've been uh, working on our energy calculations. Uh, the impact of that one small area is very incidental in terms of the overall energy performance of the building. 
Um, we are looking at, uh, or meeting all of the Palo Alto requirements for energy efficiency, but we're also, at this point, it looks like we'll be a lead silver um, uh, building. Um, we have uh, on this, both the, the southwest and southeast, the two faces you can see in this image, um, uh, a couple of uh, uh, horizontal uh, uh, sunshades, uh, and then a series of sunshades, maybe I'll go back one, a series of, a little bit hard to see here, but a series of sunshades at the main lobby area itself. Um, those would be fritted glass at the main lobby. In the other areas, it's uh, perforated metal. Um, here's a view within that, uh, in that uh, garden, the landscaped garden area, and a small, um, a small extended uh, balcony element from the second floor that would overlook the garden. And uh, the view from the rear, um, again, one of the comments was um, maybe doing something to, uh, to help break up that elevation, and so we've expressed that secondary entry on the Caltrain side. Um, just at the far edge, you can kind of see the notch in the building, and that notch, again, reflected at the southwest corner where, the, where we have all the truck loading, where we have the um, electrical rooms, uh, trash enclosure, those kinds of things. And then the view uh, straight on from uh, looking uh, toward the building, uh, coming down Olive uh, with the lobby uh, on center. Just to the left, that break in the, um, in the overhang is um, the elevator, um, uh, you know, the elevator shaft and penthouse uh, that rises up and then helps break the building and create a little bit more of an accent in that uh, location. And as staff had mentioned, um, the underside of the, you know, this really strong, very broad overhang that extends out from the building. Uh, we're looking at, I think you can see on the, on the thing here, it's something called a long, long board. And it's a, uh, it's a, uh, uh, a wood grained finish um, on, on the aluminum panels. Um, again, to create a little bit of, and introduce a little bit of warmth, and also as you look up, seeing a little bit of an accent uh, in that area. Um, just the straight on elevations. And just a, here's a section seeing the relationship between uh, the mixed use building and then ours. Um, just the plan views. And here you can see the relationship of the building and the underground garage and the, the uh, two bay wide garage. Um, just a bit more detail here. So at any rate, uh, happy to answer any of your questions. Um, so, thank you. Let's uh, see if there's anybody from the public who wishes to speak. If not, uh, yes, does anybody have questions for the applicant? Asma? Um. Yeah, I had a quick question. Um, in the front elevation, I, I noticed that the corner sort of on the left side of the image, the glass is extending past, um, it's kind of extending past the corner. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not done anywhere else in the building. Um, so it's kind of wondering about why that is and, and what that's doing there. Um, again, it was um, an effort to create um, a little bit more extension or a sense of transparency or a sense of thinness. Um, it does occur again in the, it's hard to see in this, in this image, but it, it occurs again at the first floor in the uh, metal panel. Um, the right hand side here, the metal panel extends uh, two feet beyond. So it, it's, it's a, um, it's just a means for us, it's a means of trying to, um, lighten the material, have it, give it a sense of, of lighter so we don't have this very solid, blocky kinds of corners. And so it does occur, um, it occurs, I think, three times in the metal um, at the first floor and then um, in the second floor. As it, and the extension there had a little bit to do with the fact that uh, we have that, it's a reference to this balcony that extends um, out into the, over the garage area as well. I mean the garden area. Anything else from anyone? I have a quick question. Uh, this is regarding landscape. Uh -huh. um, so I, in the paving, you're showing a um, flagstone set in a concrete framework. And I guess my question is, have you done that, have you done that before? Can you, can the flagstone meet 
um, accessibility requirements? I mean, like, I'm thinking, I don't really know what the requirements are, but I mean, normally, like, at the door threshold, you, you, we're only allowed, like, a half an inch um, change in plane. Um, and I was thinking in the flag zones that I've done on houses, it's been maybe about a half an inch. Yeah, we probably not more, but. Um, yeah, we've actually used this on a number of cases in, in pedestrian uh, plaza kind of spaces. And it's, you know, it's an issue of, of selecting material that has, you know, minimal clefting. Um, but yes, yeah, so that's definitely possible. Uh, Thank you. All right, I think that's it, thank you. Uh, discussion, we'll start in the middle this time, Alex. Uh, thank you for the changes in the project. Um, it's, it's amazing, when you have the right solution, everything falls into place easily, and when you have the wrong one, you're just pushing, you know, you're, it's like a, you're pushing a stone uphill. Um, the, I can support the project today. Uh, I have one more question for you, did you, have any thoughts about the fence along the Caltrain tracks? Is that just the exist whatever's, the, I'm assuming it's a chain link fence, is that gonna stay? Um, I believe that Caltrans, or Caltrain will have um, their required fence, but you know, we're happy to provide something along there, but I think that they will have their required um, separation fence with the, right. with the and, your, and you have the, um, the hedge and trees, right. which will screen that. Yeah, which is fine. Okay, and uh, so I can support the project today. I have some reservations about the, the uh, simulated wood grain soffit. Like we have it on the Walgreens building here, and it doesn't look. It looks okay. It doesn't look great. I think it helps on this one that you're two stories up in the air. On the Walgreens building, it's very low, and so the simulated look kind of stands out. Um, but. If I might add, yeah. um, I think you see a similar product on the Epiphany Hotel mm -hmm. building. Um, it's a different, it's a different manufacturer than this. Yeah. Those are larger panels and there's kind of a simulated look. These are um, actually made a piece at a time and so it would actually be you know, V-grooved material that, uh, so you would actually have that. We've used this in some other cases. Um, you know, it's a way of adding a little bit of warmth. Um, you know, it's, um, uh, it, it could be more neutral, but um, you know, it felt uh, to us it might be a way of, of adding a little bit of warmth. Um. Yeah, and I think it's, uh, and it helps that it's in a soffit kind of situation, yeah. where it's in shade, it's in, in shade of the building, so it, yeah. um, it's not quite as noticeable. And I think it's better than standard options. So um, I can support the project. Robert. Yeah, it you know it, it's so gratifying to sit up here, and if you make some suggestions, and then it's actually listened to. I mean, it, it uh, it's one of these things that uh, I, I like. Alex comment about if a project is wrong, no matter how you try and massage it, it just never comes out right. Uh, I'm really thrilled that you went. Uh, full circle and came with us. I could support it the way it is too. Uh, a couple of things just to reiterate. I agree that I'm not a big fan of faux wood, but in this particular case, it makes sense. It's in shade, so it's not that it's going to uh, bleach out or anything else. And two stories up, the average person is just going to look at it and automatically assume it's wood of some sort. So I don't really have a problem with it. Uh, I like it basically. Uh, it just, uh, as you said, seemed to have answered so many problems that I can support it the way it is now. Peter. Yes, I uh, share the sentiments of my so, colleagues. Um, it's, it's a much improved project. The site planning really works and that makes a lot of the rest of it work pretty well. Um, I can support it the way it is. I'd like to suggest a couple of ideas to the architect. Uh, I don't want to see they get held up, but uh, you tried to explain that you have this base when you want it to look thin. And to me, the base looks like a base. And so when you stick it out two feet on the corner, it looks like you're covering a mistake. And I'd encourage you to consider that the base of the building is a solid block or block with cut openings in it and treat it that way. My first reaction looking at it was, oh, that must be nice limestone tiles or something masonry. I can understand the metal, that's a good idea. Um, and then up on the second floor where the glass fin sticks out like that, I just, honestly, I think you guys have redesigned the whole building and it hasn't gone through the DES of design process quite enough to really refine that. I think, again, the glass mitered around the corner might be a better solution. 
again, I, I don't want to hold it up. I think it's a handsome building. Um, I do throw out that um, you have a, a large wall of glass facing your landscaped area, which then faces the residences. And at night, if people are working late, that will be very brightly illuminated, and it could become problematic for residences. We face that question on other buildings, and it might be suitable to put some sort of automatic blind system in there to protect the, the residents from that kind of problem. I mean, it just can be incredibly aggravating to somebody trying to go to sleep. Um, and then um, the same bugaboo, Tom, with other projects, where does the signage go? And if you come back with it plastered on the glass, it just doesn't look right. So um, I'm just throwing it out there now. That's not the right place for it, and you guys should really resolve what's going on with that. But thank you very much for the changes. It's really a positive improvement. Osman? Hi there. Uh, this is my first time looking at the project. Um, uh, I, I like the faux wood um, soffit. I think it adds a lot of warmth. Um, I don't know that I would like the project as much without it, so I think it's, it's a good choice. Um, the, I, I agree with uh, board member Balte that the corner conditions are um, un, they're unconvincing as a design choice. Um, even just looking at the render of, of the glass sticking out, it, it looked kind of like an accident. Um, and it's true, it's really unnoticeable in the, in the other things. So I, I would maybe encourage you to reconsider that party or, or design concept. Um, it's a really good point about the blinds. Um, and typically in, in Silicon Valley, when you, when you have uh, an office building that has a lot of glass, almost always, all the time, the blinds are down. Um, that's something to consider. Um, I appreciate your effort in shading the building. Um, I don't, I, I think you said that the shading on the lobby area is glass, but it'll have a frit. Um, I, I don't know how effective that will be in actually shading, um, but uh, I think it's something, just, just something to consider in terms of the blinds and, and how this will actually be perceived thermally. Um, on that note, because it is um, a two-story building, um, I wonder if passive ventilation or operable windows could be considered in this climate. Um, I don't know if it's not a sticking point as such, but given that this is sort of a glass box on top, it, it would be, might save on HVAC and, and other things and um, you know, provide some more sustainability um, points. Um, and, and sort of the last thing um, that I wanted to point out was that the, the backside facade, the side that faces the Caltrain, is a lot less handsome than, than the side that faces Park. Um, it, uh, it's, and I understand that it's, it's the back side and such, but assuming that this will be visible on the Caltrain side, um, just encourage um, some, more, some more thought in terms of um, how that back side is being presented. And, and maybe it just hasn't gone that extra step further that the front side has. Um, but I think uh, out of all the facades, I, I would say that side needs the most work. Um, and yeah, I think those are all my comments. Thank you. Oh, well, I would like to express my gratitude and appreciation to the applicant and the designers they're working with for bringing us a building that I think will be lovely for its occupants and a terrific um, addition to this street and neighborhood, uh, which I think is becoming very attractive, and this will certainly move it forward. You had that challenge of living, of working next to residents, which I think is unique on the block, um, and you've addressed it, and certainly since the day I got here, my colleagues have been impressing upon me that everything flows from the site plan, and certainly nothing was working before, and now it seems to me everything works uh, in quite wonderful ways. Um, I look forward to seeing this. Uh, I'm fine with the rear view. I realize I was thinking that you only see it at high speeds from Caltrain, but maybe you're so close to the station, people will sit there and look at it. But in either event, I think it's way above the norm for Caltrain views, um, in my experience. Uh, I will note to staff that uh, male employees are perfectly capable of getting mugged as well as female employees. So it's employee safety generally we were considering. 
not that I didn't raise it as a feminist issue. Um, I realize, oh, I had a question. So I know this is in the plume and that will be dealt with. It said nesting birds will be protected if feasible. What's that mean? Sure, absolutely. So it, it depends on when construction happens uh, relative to the nesting season. So that's, that's the question that, you know, depending on when construction actually begins, uh, then that mitigation measure would be, would be required to have uh, birds uh, surveyed. Uh, a biologist go out to the site uh, and actually survey to determine if there are birds that are nesting during that time period. And if so, um, then take appropriate measures. Okay, so complicated relationship between building season and bird nesting season. All right. Um, I do think the point about automatic blinds is a good one that's came up in the Stanford Research Park vis-a-vis -vis the neighborhood to the sort of southwest. Um, but I don't see a need to add additional conditions. Um, I'm just really happy that you were able to move in this direction and propose this project. Um, would somebody care to make a motion? I have some comments on findings. Perfect. So I think for staff, um, um, this is on page 164 of the packet. This is our finding number one. Um, so we have a po policy L2.2, enhance connections between commercial and mixed use centers and the surrounding residential neighborhoods by promoting, promoting walkable and bikes, bikeable connections and a diverse range of retail and services that cater to the daily needs of residents. And so I think uh, what you've written in there in response to that is fine. And then I think I would add that there are, um, in addition, there are uh, bulb outs, street trees, benches, and also the, um, the plaza in front of the building actually makes a wider sidewalk. So that also helps with the pedestrian amenities. And that's all that I have. Anybody else? I have a question for the applicant or the architect. Um, is is passive ventilation something that you guys considered already? You know, with the um, um, in terms of our energy calculations and the in the um, the systems that we need to use in order to achieve um, the requirements. Um, the idea of, of passive ventilation or, or openable windows is probably not in the cards for us. Um, as we've gone through the energy calculations to date with the uh, designers. Uh, Meaning that it wouldn't, it wouldn't work? Right. Like it, would it wouldn't work. ventilate the area? Right. Okay. Um, Thank you. I, people have tried to have like, uh, I'm thinking uh, in, when I lived in New York City, there was like a skyscraper and they had tried to add ventilation slots in the curtain wall and it wreaked havoc on the HVAC system because it couldn't, it wasn't at that time, it wasn't smart enough to figure out what was happening all, all the way up, all the way through the building. I would imagine that that could change in the future. Um, but I think with like the old style technology, it doesn't, yeah, I don't think it works. Well, typically, I mean, office buildings are usually like big, I mean, HVAC, heating, cooling is one of the biggest energy uses. And because this is a small-ish building, um, I, I can understand why that wouldn't work for a high rise or a skyscraper, but this is two stories. And yeah, I mean, it's given its size, and our temperature or weather, I, I don't see why it wouldn't work. Okay, does somebody want to make a motion? If there's, is there more further, is there more further discussion? Robert. Sure, uh, I'll, I move we uh, accept the project as presented uh, with the uh, added requirement of some sort of a shading situation for the, uh, or, uh, lighting on the uh, residential side. Well, automatic nightshades. Automatic nightshades. Well, I mean, it doesn't need to be that, just something the, to, uh, you know, whether it's something on a fixed basis or automatic nightshades, it'd be fine. Is there a second? I'll second that. So that's a motion to, um, would the maker and seconder accept a 
friendly amendment to add to the findings on page 164, item policy L2-2, an additional sentence that Alex will give us. Oh, sure, that's fine. But I think it is that uh, street trees, you have it, street trees, bulb outs, benches in the plaza provide additional pedestrian amenities. Okay. That's fine with me too. And the condition with respect to the uh, nighttime light spillover management is clear? Everybody? All right. Um, on the automatic nightshades, so the, the issue has, has been um, is sometimes when a tenant changes, then they change window shades. And I think the staff had worded the, um, on, um, on the, was it Hanover? On the Hanover property that it was in the, I think the, the developer offered to put it in their lease, that the, the requirement was that they have it in their lease and so that when tenants change, then they know that they still have to maintain that. Because what happens usually is that, yeah, somebody, somebody will change, change the shade system. Well, we can either require that they put it in the lease or simply say the developer, the property owner shall maintain um, adequate late hour screening to avoid light spillover and glare to the residential properties adjacent. Okay, we have a motion, we have a second, is that right? Well, is it, is it clear what the motion is regarding the light shades? I just heard two different ways of requesting that it be enforced. Well, I think it, it probably just needs to be something there. I'm not too worried about it because uh, I've done it also on mechanical uh, or uh, situations the outside of the building, so a tenant can't change how that works. I mean, there are alternatives to uh, nightshades. Would staff like to propose language? Uh, I think we get the idea. I, I think we can um, fine tune the, the language, I guess. I like the idea of adding it into the lease, and so we'll find some way to incorporate that into there. I'm, I'm not comfortable I'm with that. that. Yeah. So I think we should know what we're saying. And what we're saying is that the property owner shall provide and maintain shading? Some sort of shading Some device. sort of shading to prevent uh, light glare and spillover into the adjacent neighborhood property, including adding provisions to tenant leases if necessary. Well, that, is that acceptable to us all? That's, that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. Close enough for government work? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Nay. One opposition, would you care to expand upon your opposition? Um, I think I mentioned most of it in my comments, but just that the back facade needs work and, and there's some other sort of architectural items that need development. But. Thank you. Well, thanks to everybody for their proposals and participation. Did you have another comment or are you all happy? <laughs> yes, we'll do. Thanks. Okay. Our next item is 392 California Avenue. Uh, which is a request for a facade change. Does staff need a few minutes to set up? Are you ready to go? Keep going. We're going to take two minutes.
Okay, we're on item number six. Is that right? Yep. 392 California Avenue, recommendation on applicant's request for approval of a minor architectural review to allow changes to the facade of an existing commercial building in the California Avenue Business District uh, involving a new storefront window system, individually illuminated channel letter signs, uh, and a new custom abstract mural by artist Victor Reyes, exempt from CEQA. May we have the staff report? Uh, thank you, Chair Firth, uh, Vice Chair Belte, and board members. Um, this is the second hearing uh, for the Summit Bicycles Facade Changes Project. Excuse me, could we ask you to introduce yourself oh, on, for the tape? Uh, yes, Associate Planner Scott McKay. And um, this is the second hearing. Uh, it was previously reviewed by the board on September 21st, 2017. Um, and as you said, the project includes new storefront window system, an individually illuminated channel letter sign, and a new um, custom abstract uh, mural graphic. Um, the primary comments that were in direction given by the board during the first hearing uh, included that the black and white colors of the mural uh, were too intense and overpowering. Uh, more differentiation was needed between the mural and the signage. And um, there was also one board member felt the mural was attractive but should not be on the front of the building. Um, to address these comments, several different lighter color schemes were explored and studied. Uh, ultimately, a lighter gray and white uh, design was selected. And also, uh, the returns on the channel letters are, are black to provide some contrast between the sign and the mural. Um, at the time of the hearing, there haven't been any new public comments that have been received. Um, and so we have the uh, project architects, uh, Rebecca Pollard and Celine Watkins from Terry J. Martin Associates uh, in attendance. And uh, they'll be making a presentation as well. And both staff and applicant are available to answer any, any questions you may have. And remind me who the applicant is. Um, the applicant uh, is Terry J. Martin and Associates on behalf of the, the business owner, Ian Christie. Good hear from the applicant, you have 10 minutes. Thank you. Uh, good morning, my name is Rebecca Pollard um, and I represent Terry Martin Associates, the architect on this project. Um, the owner and artist were unable to come today, uh, but you have all of uh, the information on our project uh, has already been stated and I would uh, love to answer any questions that you have. Are there any members of the public who wish to comment on this project? Hearing none. Uh, if I may, I just wanted to make clear, we were talking to our arts department the other day and um, they wanted to make clear to the public and city staff that this mural is a private mural and it's not a public mural being run through the standard city process. Thank you. Uh, any questions of applicant? I have one. So for a number of years, and I think still, California law provides protection for murals uh, constructed on private property and it's difficult to remove them. There's an exception for commercial uh, art done under contract. Do you anticipate that this graphic element is going to be protected or not? Um, protected as in kept on the building? As in California law, which gives certain moral rights to the artist and interferes with removal? Um, I am not sure I can answer that accurately. It's the first I've heard of uh, protect, protection under law. But it's not your intention that this would be a permanently protected I don't believe graphic so. In the event that the business changed. As far as I know, if the building uh, was to change ownership, the uh, mural would not be protected. Thank you. Steph, any? Any additional insight on this issue? Uh, we do have Elise DeMarco here, and she may be able to give us some more clarification. Great. Could you introduce yourself? Gladly. My name is Elise DeMarzo. I'm the uh, director of the public art program for the city of Palo Alto. Um, I just wanted to give a, a brief clarification because um, we did have some concerns with the way the report represents this as a mural as opposed to a graphic. 
Um, and it does show a number of murals that went through the proper process and went to the Public Art Commission for approval. So um, when I was asked to review uh, this graphic several months ago, I determined that it did not need to go to the Public Art Commission because it is not public art, because it's an abstracted bicycle. It's really tied to the tenant there and goes through a different process. So that, of course, makes sense to come to the ARB and not to the Public Art Commission. However, the other murals that are there did go through the proper public art process through the Public Art Commission. So um, we, of course, want to be sure that the ARB has the full con like context of the visual landscape as you're considering this graphic, but I ask that it be referred to as a graphic and not a mural, which would be a public art concern. Thank you. And I'm not an expert at all on California art law, but I certainly have been involved in disputes in earlier phases of my life about the removal of privately, uh, privately owned property, no public involvement, uh, and the landlord not having an unfettered right to remove that art. Can you tell me anything about that? <laughs> Do you have an hour? Um, yes, Briefly. There, there, there are lots of concerns about um, public art and an artist's rights when they are creating a custom piece that goes onto a building. So um, for the public art and private development, which does go for review through the Public Art Commission, um, we make it very clear that it is up to the commissioning body, which is the owner of the building, to uh, comply with all national and um, and state laws regarding Visual Artist Rights Act and California um, protections. Um, as you may know, we're undergoing some of these um, some of these same legal issues with the deaccession and removal of a couple of public artworks currently. I guess what I'm hoping to know is if we approve this, have we approved something uh, that will be difficult to remove if there's a change? I, mean, I get the feeling that it, uh, like I said, that it's a graphic. That no, if the next person or the tenant comes in, it can be eliminated. I have a question for the applicant. Um, what 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 material is this being painted on? Uh, it is currently a, uh, a, a stucco material, and it's painted on the building. Yes, it'll be painted directly onto the building. Thank you. Um, all right. Anybody else have any questions? Or comments? Before we vote, or make somebody make a motion? Robert? Well, <clears throat> the last time we saw this, it was basically a very large uh, graphic of a bicycle with the word Summit Bicycles put in there that was black and white. Uh, and I see all this verbiage and all basically it looks like that's happened is it's gone from black and white to gray and white. So I wasn't a fan then, I'm still not a fan. Alex. Yeah, I can recommend approval of the project. Peter. I cannot support this project. Um, the mural, as I see it, is essentially a sign, being an abstraction of a bicycle wheel and gears, et cetera, and therefore the whole building is a sign, and that just violates our sign ordinance. If I give you the benefit of the doubt and say, no, this is indeed a graphic, some sort of an architectural embellishment, um, I think we're on an incredibly slippery slope. If all commercial facades in town featured this kind of abstract signage, the whole built environment would be this cacophony of commercialism. Imagine walking down California Avenue and everybody having one of these abstract signs about their businesses. At best, this would become a modest tourist attraction on California Avenue. More likely, it's just a visual jarring competition for attention. It's just totally inappropriate. It would become billboards pretending to be art, but seen up close in our faces in a commercial area. It's just totally inappropriate to let this sort of signage be put on our buildings in town. Thank you. Asma. Um, I would say at this point, um, I'm keen to hear more discussion. At the time, it's it's a little difficult to see also the, the way that this has been presented. The context is sort of not readily available. So it's hard to say how jarring this would be given not knowing the adjacent murals and such. 
Um, as it stands, uh, I, I can't say it's, I, I'm sort of gonna hear some more discussion before I make my decision on whether I can approve this or not. Okay, well, I'm thoroughly confused. Um, a mural, this, first of all, this came to us as a mural, a custom abstract mural with a named artist involved with it. It didn't say commercial designer, it said mural. And our code says, a mural is a work of art applied to a building wall for decorative purposes only. Use of murals for advertising is not permitted. And a sign is any, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It seems to me I'm getting lots of people, I, one of the messages I'm getting from the city is this is not an artwork as in a mural. Um, I don't have any inherent objection to um, lots of graphic elements on buildings. Um, I know some very attractive small commercial districts that do that. Um, I appreciate the fact that the murals that we typically see on this street are uh, commissioned as artwork, commissioned as murals, may or may not be closely tied to the commercial enterprises taking place in the building. Um, so if we approve this as not a mural, then what are we approving it as? Sorry. A sign, a not sign, a decorative element? Is that a question? That's a question, that's not rhetorical. I, I think there's, there's uh, as is frequently the case in government, different departments have different definitions of what things mean. And our community services department has a very clear uh, set of uh, protocols for how public art is treated and what is defined. The planning department has a sign code that was established in the 70s or, so, you know, and it's not been updated sufficiently. And so in the, under the planning code, it is considered a, a mural, though we understand the, um, the distinction that, uh, you know, the city is also making with respect to a public art process. And I, and I don't think those two are um, incompatible. I don't have any problem with understanding this isn't public art. What I have trouble with is not the art code, if we have one, it's the sign code which says a mural is a work of art applied to a building for decorative purposes only and their use for advertising is not permitted. Sure. Is that so, right? So is that the code we're supposed to be applying here? Yeah, so, so to that point. That's the context in which we're working. So the, so the director has the authority to enforce the zoning code, including the sign code, and uh, you know, this has been looked at, and it is abstract. Uh, I think you can see, I can see a bike in it, others can see you know, other things in it. I, I think it's abstract enough to that it is, uh, qualifies and meets the definition of a, of a, of a mural. So that's, that's the premise under so which So you see operating. it as a decorative element not used for advertising purposes? We see it as a mural. Thank you. And we have others. So on the side of Perry Baguette, there's a painted graphic. Uh, at the shopping center, I think the Nike. Isn't that, that precedes Paris Baguette? No. No, it's a new one? I've never noticed it. That was part of Paris Baguette project. Right. Oh, now I remember that one. Um, Not an extraterrestrial. Yeah. So, uh, and then also I think at the shopping center, I think the side of the Nike store has a painted graphic. I don't, I can't even, I couldn't even tell you what it is, but I've noticed, you know, I've seen it. Um, and then I think we did try to discourage the shopping center folks from doing more of that. Um, the last time uh, the approvals for the um, for their current mm -hmm. phase went through. So, so we have pres we, there are precedents for it. Um, and then there, there's one that was debated here with this board was the uh, design within reach store mm -hmm. on the side facade. Right. Whereas I recall, we did not accept the deconstructed chairs. That's correct. Um, if I may interject a comment. Um, 
Regarding the, uh, uh, the argument that the entire piece is a sign because it is an abstract bicycle, I do understand where you're coming from. However, we did submit, af uh, after hearing that complaint in the last meeting, the, the last hearing, excuse me, uh, we, we submitted to planning multiple different designs that were in no way related to a bicycle and were told on each one of them, no, we were, uh, we were to keep this original design and just make it less jarring and in your face color wise. Thank you. So I'm actually tr uh, thinking that maybe jarring in your face may be something that's on a positive note, where if it becomes a little bit uh, more colorful, then it, it takes away from the whole thought that it looks like a bicycle. And I think also the fa the biggest thing concern I have is, uh, you know, possibly if if the word, uh, you know, summit bicycles was, I don't know, freestanding on the uh, canopy or something or whatever, so it's totally out of the graphic mural, whatever you want to call it, then you don't equate the two. Considering uh, any, whether you put a black box around it or not, to me, that is just one massive sign. And if you could separate those two, uh, then I'd be more, I don't have a problem with uh, having some sort of a colorful, uh, you know, mural, graphic, whatever you want to call it, uh, what we, uh, what the one at the, uh, shopping center just that has eat what was it gots or whatever so i mean you know there are all kinds of things around here so i don't have a problem that, with that, that I, one's gone now <laughs> oh it, well okay but i mean there was one there that's what i'm saying it, it, <laughs> we, uh, we had it removed and it uh so it's just the fact that to me this looks like a you know 20 foot by 50 foot sign or 40 foot sign whatever it is and that's the problem i have with it so if those two could be isolated like i said for a freestanding uh you know, individual letter, uh, you know, sign on the uh, the soffit or on the uh, the little parapet overhang, whatever you want to call it. Uh, you know, and then uh, the mural behind it, either more colorful or something. I don't know, whatever. It it just, but I don't like it like this. To me, it's just a huge sign. Okay, um, Osmo, has that helped you? It helped your reasoning process here. Yeah, I think I think there's something. It's true. There's something kind of strange uh, about having it integrated, because um, you know somebody walking on the street. It's obviously the sign isn't for anybody walking on the street, so you wouldn't really correct. It's more for uh, vehicles passing by. <laughs> okay. Or for pedestrians on the other side of the street. Okay. Right. With the overhang, with the existing overhang on the building. Uh, whether the sign was on the wall or on the overhang, it's highly unlikely you would see it from the same side of the street on the sidewalk. Sorry, can you say that again? Um, so if the, uh, the channel letter sign, uh, if it remains on the wall as proposed or uh, you know, separated and put down on the overhang piece, either way, it's still not really visible if you're walking along that side of the street. Right, yeah. I plead with my colleagues to think this is really a billboard. A billboard's made to be seen from big distances. It's very large when you're driving by. You just heard her say you can't even see this as a pedestrian. But Robert just explained it's 50 feet wide. That's what you call a billboard. Do we want billboards on California Avenue? Is there a way to have the signage not on that rectangular space? Uh, the text. Technically, yes, the text is a, uh, a separate channel sign and it could be moved. The intent was Where? to have it be um, less separate from the mural, but uh, if it means passing, we would be uh, very willing to consider moving it. Staff have a comment on that? Can you provide assistance on that issue? Let me just be clear that the, the, the letters, the channel letter signs are five inches in front of the facade of the building, right? The rendering makes it all look flat, but if you look at the details, it's a, it's a, it's a three-dimensional sign. Correct. So I'll, I'll tell you all where I am, and it's not going to be very helpful. Um, I'm fine with decorative, considering decorative elements on a facade such as this. It's not a particularly lovely thing. Un embellished, and so I can certainly imagine that some kind of graphic uh, element would be an improvement. 
Um, I do read this as a large ad. It looks, I don't care, if, I mean, to me the fact that the, these are channel letters, they're illuminated and they step out a bit, doesn't keep this from being reading to me walking across the street as a sign. So to me, this would not pass the, you know, the, the test of, uh, is this a suitable graphic element that isn't used for advertising? Uh, and that also um, leads me to the conclusion that it doesn't meet our other findings as an aesthetic treatment um, of this surface of this building. I do think that the streetscape would benefit from having something happening there other than a big blank wall. But I agree. If, uh, you know, if they took the, the mural or the, the, the graphic off and just had the signage, yeah, that wouldn't improve it. I don't think that's, that's helping the matter any, just having uh, the word uh, Summit I'm sorry. Bicycles. Oh, just having the word Summit Bicycles on a blank wall, I don't think that's helping either. <laughs> but this isn't the solution. Well, if we were to ask the applicant to return one more time to talk to us, what kind of direction would we be giving so that they would have clarity? Or perhaps somebody wants to make a motion on this today. The graphic and the actual words or the sign itself or the, actually the words itself, the letters have to be separated. The text. The text have to be separated. When you say separated, do well, you mean? Well, like I said, either physically or something where the two are obviously uh, different. Or if it has uh, summit bicycles at the top and the mural is, let's say, lower, uh, isn't quite as high, but the same width. So the two are isolated from each other. You know, the, uh, you could have the words, uh, I'm just saying, summit bicycle, let's say, for sake of argument, centered a little bit higher it is than the mural, the actual gray part is only half the size of the uh, parapet. So it actually looks like uh, a painting hanging there or whatever the case is, something like that, where the two are distinctly different. This one, the one is inside the other, no matter how you look at it. So even though it's sticking out, because it is sticking out of the wall a little bit, so. Yeah, but five inches over a, you know, 20 by 50 foot, uh, that's almost uh, undiscernible. Okay, Robert, I agree with you. I can support. I think that makes sense. Okay. You follow what I'm, what I'm saying? Uh, mostly, yes. Okay. We, we did attempt to address it with the, the color contrast, but I see where you're coming from. Okay. So um, I will say that I think my problem is that this thing reads as a single visual message. Big box, interesting colors, textures, shapes, and text. I mean, it reads like an ad, um, which is right. not what we permit. So the sign needs, to, the, the text needs to be isolated from the art. And I'm going to use the word art because I'm tired of saying graphic. And even though I mean um, something that you do not anticipate will be protected under state or federal law. Um, I think that I actually think the law helps explain what the problem is here, because I don't think anybody thinks that this is a standalone piece of art that would necessarily uh, be adapted by a different commercial use. Right. It's too closely tied uh, to the notion of bicycles. Um, but that alone would not keep me from approving it. It's the fact that you have text in it. And having text in front of it doesn't matter. If I'm across the street, I'm going to read the whole rectangle. I'm not going to read. Oh, drawing, oh, text, I'm gonna see it all at once. It's gonna be the same field of vision. So I don't know what our code permits. Um, uh, staff always explains it, which is helpful. Um, you know, if it was attached to the protruding element there, that might work, but it needs to not read as part of the graphic element. Yeah, I, I yeah. agree, the, it has to, uh, the key word is they need to be separate. They can't, one can't be on top of the other or blended together as one uh, accommodation. So, you know, I said one on top of the other, and that's one of the reasons why I'm breaking my own rule of not trying to design a project from here. Otherwise, so they come back and say, see, this is what you told me to do. How come you're not approving it now? So it, uh, all of the, that's why I don't like doing that. So the, the idea is just the two need to be separate. There is a sign and there is a graphic. And uh, right now that isn't working. Yeah, I think also, I think part of the reason I'm struggling with this is also because 
it's, it's, hard, it's hard to think of which lens to look at this. Am I looking at this as you know, an aesthetic, decorative, architectural thing, yes, or am are. I trying to justify this as you know, embellishing a really big sign and somehow adding this art, artistry to the street? Um, I think you know, if you guys come back, um, it, it would be worth putting some effort in justifying why this belongs in the context and then also differentiating kind of what Robert's saying, like d d d differentiating the sign with whatever aesthetic architectural embellishments that you're making so that we can actually look at it as this is an architectural embellishment and a sign versus it's, you know, gra grappling with like this is a billboard and so it's, it's sort of hard to, hard to judge it in that sense. Peter, do you want to add anything? <laughs> no, I think I've been quite clear. I don't think anybody's going to argue with you. Um, I think that we do have to look at it as a work of art applied for decorative purposes only. Um, and I don't think it's approvable uh, on, in that way. I think it needs to be separated uh, from building signage so that one can appreciate the one without the other. Um, and I... Uh, had a third point, which is eluding me. So then is the question, do we bring it back or do we just reject well, I think it we as is? The, I think we asked the applicant if you'd like to come back or would you like us to vote on it today? Oh, and I know what I wanted to say. I agree with my colleagues who said that when you're looking at it as a decorative element, then you need to know about context. And that's a little hard to figure here. If, if we could make a suggestion, um, would, would moving the text uh, to the canopy, um, would that solve some of the questions? And would there need to be other changes or would just that one move be sufficient? Alex? I think that would help a lot. Robert? It helps, but it helps, but if you're standing across the street, you still read the one in back of the other. So you really haven't changed that much. What about below the canopy? Um, I believe that it, could you know, be it, done. It's it's a help, but it. Uh... Yeah. Um, Osman, did you have any further comments? Um, yeah, I think it's it's mainly that um, I don't know the the context. I think is really important to understand how, how to approve this. I guess the main concern I have is if you take the lettering out, then all of a sudden you've got a mural that is very busy on the left-hand side towards the bottom and a big blank gray spot up on top. And then all of a sudden I think it's going to detract from the, the, the mural is going to look strange. Or the, again, the, <laughs> the graphic is going to look strange. And then when you see the sign or the letters on the bottom on the, uh, on the canopy, then all of a sudden the white of the letters with a background that's very busy with gray and white, you're never going to be able to read the sign. So you're defeating the purpose of reading the sign. So that would be a quick fix for something that's still not going to work. Right? I mean, if the, if the letters uh, Summit Bicycles were down on the overhang right in front of where you the busiest normally, part of the graphic is. You would is, normally not. For an illuminated sign, I mean, usually there'd be some sort of backing. Mm. When, when you put no, a sign right. on for top of the it's, awning, it's, it's, it's But not... I'm talking about during the daytime, when you drive by, you're going to see the sign, right, and directly in back of it, you're going to see the busiest part of the graphic. And it's going to totally destroy the, uh, the readability of the sign. Excuse me. Of so, the letters. So it seems to me that one problem we have is that these were designed to be integrated. This mural assumes there's going to be text over there. Right, I think exactly. Correct. It's designed that way. So I would propose that we suggest that the applicant come back for another round and tell us what you would like to do, having heard our comments today. Uh, and I personally am going to be uh, interested in how whatever you propose works in the streetscape along that side, how it looks from across the street, and that the uh, signage identifying the building preferably is below the canopy, so I'm not going to read one against the other, but I'm not going to right, say that I, that's I, essential. And I think if they, if they want to use the, uh, the mural of some sort, or a mural, 
than, uh, or a graphic, whatever you want to call it. The graphic should be smaller, so it has a border around it of wall, and then the, uh, the sign goes on top, on the bottom, whatever, somewhere, not directly in front of the uh, graphic. Okay, anybody have any further comments before? Do we, staff, do you have a date certain or date uncertain? Uh, somebody want to make a motion to continue this to a date uncertain? That's fine. I'll, I'll move we uh, move this to a date, uh, a future date uncertain. Is there a second? I will second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. I, I'm opposed. You would, Peter, your comments, please. Um, yes, I think we should say call a spade a spade. Um, I don't see this can come back in any form close to it and still meet the requirements we've set, and yet we're not willing to just come out and say this is not appropriate. No, that's what we're here for. To keep continuing things just keeps furthering the process. The applicant spends more money. The city spends more time. And we haven't really given them clear direction. I thought it was reasonably clear, but you may very well be correct. I, I think, you know, that's, that's probably the idea that we talked about the last thing. If uh, once you have a good design, it's just, this is so difficult, it's real tough to make it work. And we're tr sitting up here trying to make it work. Well, I've been thinking about the scale of the projects we've looked together, looked at today, and of course, every project is important to the applicant, every project is important to its environments, but you know, one of Parkinson's law is that the time spent on an agenda item varies inversely with its scope and scale. And right. I think we just demonstrated that. <laughs> because we all tend to think we know what we're talking about when we look at small items. Uh, physically small, not unimportant. Um, that is it. So we do have a motion on the table. We I have a motion. I believe we voted. Oh, didn't we have 4-1? It was 4-1. Okay, 4-1. Okay. <laughs> we had a motion and a dissent. And I remember to ask the dissenter why. Didn't know we were going to get quite such a personal attack, but hey. <laughs> Um, is, let's see, um, any other public comment on study session items? We have a lot of minutes to approve. Um, and then, okay, so we have three sets of minutes. Are people prepared to make motions on those? First, a motion on the minutes of February 1st. I'm sorry, I'm doing this backwards. January 18th, 2018. Any, like, uh, yeah. Oh, I missed a letter here? His question whether the minutes were accurate. He was here, but he... Okay. We have a comment from uh, one of the people who, sp who spoke on behalf of the former owners of the restaurant site on Emerson. Um, I am not in a position to comment on this. Can staff? I, I don't know what you're yes. looking at or, or where we are in the Well, let's tell you what, what we're going to do. We are on approval of minutes. And we are looking at the um, minutes of February 1st. That's uh, number, number seven in the Good book. point. Would you like to comment? Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry to, to bother you. I know it's I'm sorry, you have three minutes. Oh, my name is uh, Daniel Myers. Yes. M-Y-E-R-S. I spoke uh, yes. to the Architectural Review Board, you, you folks, on February 1st, very briefly. Um, uh, I think the item is item number seven mm -hmm. in the agenda mm -hmm. book. Mm -hmm. And the actual text is not in the book, but. That's correct. Um, I'm just asking that um, my segment, which uh, is about 21 lines, be amended uh, neutrally um, w w without any contention. Um, I, I'm not really a, a professional public speaker or anything. I uh, don't belong to Toastmasters or anything like that. And I suppose I spoke you know, very softly. I, uh, a few days ago, I looked at the uh, video, the audio video mm -hmm. online, mm -hmm. and there was an automatic translator. Oh, it was terrible. Um, I'm sure. And uh, it, it didn't 
really reflect what I said, and I, I don't know who else might be uh, maligned, <laughs> so to speak. But I, this morning I sent you a, uh, an email just to ask you to uh, amend the content of uh, my presentation because it didn't uh, uh, reflect uh, some of my hand gestures, which I think were important. And um, uh, in my email to you, let's see, on page number 10 and 11 of the uh, proposed draft minutes uh, that you're being asked to approve of here, um, line four of my presentation, and in total, I had about uh, 21 lines. Uh, on page 10 and 11. And uh, line four, um, I would like to add uh, a parenthetical item uh, to have the sentence read, I had difficulty finding information about this agenda item, where in the report it said, uh, I had difficulty finding information about this item, and let me just turn this idiot thing off. Um, line five, um, uh, I said uh, from Mr. What's-His-Face here, I was uh, pointing to, I was gesturing to um, the employee of the planning department, Samuel Gutierrez, that is not represented in the, um, uh, in, in the minutes. I, I don't mean to interrupt, but basically yeah. well, uh, the way Please I'd... don't, Robert. He has okay. three minutes, and oh, then we'll go, deal go with ahead. this. Red, so. Okay, then. Thank you. We have your, your time is up, oh, and uh, okay. we will, um, we have your document, which yeah. we have read. So if you could take your seat, we'll decide how to proceed. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, again, sorry to bother you. I know it's been a long time. You are entitled to speak to us, um, we will listen. And I'm sorry that I missed the fact that we didn't have the acoustic cues. Thank you, Robert. <laughs> um, I'm going to suggest that we not act on the February 1st meeting uh, minutes because we haven't had a chance to, to see if we agree with these minor corrections. Um, so does anybody have a motion to make on the December 21st meetings? Does anybody move approval? Minutes? I have a question on the, on the minutes. Which one? For, um, for the December mm -hmm. minutes. So, like a lot of the speaker names are wrong. Wrong, and I know we're trying to fix that. But is there not a way to do that manually with the speaker cards? Yes. yes. Yes, we can do that, and we will we will try to do a better job of those. The speaker cards usually go back to the planners, and that's sort of they on a separate lost. track from the minutes, and that's where it goes awry. Okay. Well, I will try to ask people to spell their names, but I often forget. Did you want to? Did you have any changes you wanted to request, or just wanted to lament our process? Yeah. No, I don't. I'm not going to request any changes. I think we we should fix whatever we're doing. We should yeah. fix the process because it doesn't, it doesn't look good. Um, and a lot of the speakers are regular speakers. Yeah. The, the, this is the usual same cast of characters and somehow it just looks really bad if we don't, if we're sort of n not even recognizing that. I agree with you. And then we I, shouldn't approve it until we get it corrected. You can, you can direct us to correct the names with your approval. Okay. Well, I know. Are we going to do a motion for all three, um, or are we going to do it separately? Just to, Wait, I have a question. Okay. If if I found some typos, what's the best way to we just, it? just email or staff? Yes, you okay. just email us to us. All right. Um, well, I would propose that we have a single motion to approve December twenty first and January eighteenth, subject to correction of the spelling of the names of speakers and other typos. Oh. We won't mention the other typo. Those are <laughs> those are clerical errors. They don't have to be in our official transcript. Okay. So was that a motion? Yeah, or I second? move. I will second. <laughs> that. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed. 
Okay, I would move that we continue the matter of the February 1st minutes to our next meeting so that staff can review and determine if any of these requested corrections are appropriate. Is there a second? second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, we have no subcommittee mi minutes, mi matters, is that correct? Uh, that is correct. We have no subcommittee items. Um, I did want to clarify on the transcriber. Um, you know, this is a third party cr transcriber. Um, so there is, you know, this is not staff right. putting their own bias into this minutes. They are verbatim minutes. Um, but we will ensure that that is what is being done. We know that's a difficult assignment. We understand that it's done by strangers. Um, anybody have any board member questions, comments, or announcements? I do. Um, I was walking by the Bank of America down Lytton the other day and came across a construction site for a building we recently looked at, uh, which was absolutely flat except for one short standing wall. And we looked at this building as the uh, sort of modification of an existing non-conforming, non-complying use. And I didn't really understand the uh, extent to which one could essentially tear a building down to its foundations and continue to uh, have previously existing non-complying features. I understand that our laws in Palo Alto are very favorable to retaining those features, but it would be helpful to have some guidance from staff on that. So thank you. I, di I did receive your question yesterday, and we did a little bit of research on that. Um, I believe you're referring to the 480 Lytton project. Um, I can remember addresses, yes. Yeah. So. That's right. We're not discussing it. We can report back. Correct. So we don't we don't have a full answer at this moment, and so um, we would get back to you at the next hearing with that answer. Thank you. Anything else before we adjourn? Staff, board members, thank you all for your participation. Meeting is adjourned. About the black paint that's on the uh, slow, slow project in the Bank of America, which still has no landscaping after two and a half years. Uh, the Across Bank of the street from 480 Lytton. Yeah, downtown, yes, we will have to look into that. So you're saying there's black paint? Thank you.